And the angel appeared to the virgin and said, Hail, thou full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Then Elizabeth, moved by the Holy Spirit, says, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Tomorrow on our church calendar is the commemoration of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So naturally it gets moved to the nearest Sunday. If I were to do a poll, take a wager, probably Lutheran churches around the United States today are overwhelmingly observing the ninth Sunday after Trinity instead. There's sort of a feeling of not wanting to commemorate the Blessed Virgin Mary. Sometimes we even get uncomfortable saying the Blessed Virgin Mary, despite the fact that she just said in the text herself that all generations will call her blessed. It doesn't get more revelation-y than that. Why is it that we get a little bit uncomfortable, particularly as Lutherans? It's that whole American thing. Really, it is. European Lutherans don't have that issue. European Lutherans have no issue with the traditional liturgy, the traditional titles, the traditional structure. They kept all of that stuff. American Lutherans arrived in these shores blessedly seeking out our religious freedom like so many others, but we were very quickly shamed and embarrassed by our Mesopotamian neighbors about things we did that they judged entirely too Roman. We got scared. There's people that are scared of candles. There are people that are scared of vestments. There are people that are scared of vicons. It's a weird phenomenon for some of us, but it is out there and it persists. We, of course, don't want to be mistaken for Roman Catholics. Don't get me wrong. Certainly, we don't want our neighbors to get the impression that we worship the Blessed Virgin or that we offer prayers to her or think that she was without sin or perfect in some fashion or worse yet, has a role, a direct role now in our redemption, far be it. But it is also hard to fathom that it could ever be the will of our God in man, Jesus Christ in flesh, that we should not love his mother or that we should not want to talk about his mom. I mean, that's just silly. So when it comes up on the church calendar, I like to sneak it in there. Not every year, if you notice, but I sneak it in there enough that I can recycle the same sermon on the Virgin Mary because you don't remember the last one. No, I'm just kidding. What is critically important about the Blessed Virgin Mary is her role in history. In Genesis 3.15, God promises that a descendant of the woman, the one who would give birth to the son, who would crush the head of the serpent. If you ever read the verses together, it almost seems like God's will, even though... Well, we know that the verses in the Bible are numbered centuries later. But if you read Genesis 3.15 and John 3.16 together, right, he will crush his head. She will stri he will strike his heel, but he will crush his head. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The fulfillment of this in a teenage girl, a virgin in the first century in Judea, of all places in the vastness of the cosmos, in precisely the place that God had promised and prophesied down through the ages, is literally the turning point of all cosmic history. It is the turning point of creation, that God enters human flesh, his life, his ministry, his death, his resurrection. Everything that follows in the creed, from his humiliation to his glorification, meaning leaving the heavenly realms to become as one of us, to ascending into heaven, or in this creed, the descent into hell to proclaim his victory. This is the humiliation of God becoming man and his exaltation of returning. This is the most important event in all of human history. It begins when the angel appears to Mary and says, this is the time, now is the moment, you are the woman. You are the one that are going to bear God inside. Theotokos, the fancy Greek word, Theotokos, God-bearer, the one who will carry a baby in her womb that is nothing less than truly God as well as truly man. You see, understanding who the Virgin Mary is and her role in it all is fundamental to understanding who Jesus is. We are surrounded, as St. Paul, our namesake, said, by a great cloud of witnesses, knowing 
who was king, who was emperor in the year of Tiberius, when Quirinius called Romulus was governor, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, knowing the names of these apostles and disciples, knowing all about the mother of Jesus, his stepfather, Joseph, all of it puts everything into the historical context on purpose, that this is not mythology, this is real. And it is the most critical event of cosmic history, the fulfillment of a promise given in the Garden of Eden right before our exile. How can we not want to know the details, cherish the details, ponder the details, and understand the context of our liberation? The Virgin Mary, along with all of these signposts in the scripture, are worthwhile for even just that purpose. The context of understanding our faith at its origin, understanding the Bible, understanding what Scripture says. Anyone who grabs a Bible today and says, forget all of that stuff at church, I will read it for myself and figure out what it says. That person will come up with a religion, but that religion will not be Christianity. Without the historical context, without the original biblical languages and what those words meant in the context of each century without knowing something about these people who lived and experienced these things through the church of God Almighty and then were compelled by the Holy Ghost to write it down, we will never be able to fathom it. Why would we want to? Divorce ourselves from the great cloud of witnesses, from the historical reality the established millennia of struggling after the truth and staying steadfast to the word of God. To dismiss those things is awfully silly. But there's something else, of course, with the Virgin Mary being uniquely the one to carry God in her womb. The Gospels could be said to be the story of two Marys because there's a symbolism involved. Mary Magdalene, the harlot taken in adultery who will be stoned to death, instead is forgiven, redeemed, cleansed, and made whole. It is she that will anoint the feet of Jesus, weeping with her hair. She is, all of us, the sinner wedded to the world, the sinner in its fornications with Satan and worldly things, the sinner in us that is reprobate and degenerate and sick, but is brought to faith, brought to healing, brought to redemption. Being cleansed in the font, in the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, we then become part of the church, which is always symbolized by the feminine, which the Virgin Mary symbolizes. The Virgin Mary, though a human and not a goddess, though human and not perfect, nevertheless is a virgin. She is given to us in the text as one who is young, symbolizing the new creation yet to come. One who is a virgin, that is chaste and loyal and faithful. She is symbolically all the things that Mary Magdalene is not, but these two women will arrive at the empty tomb to bear witness together of the redemption, the resurrection of their singular Lord and Savior and the guarantee of their collective redemption along with us and all who would believe. The womb of the Blessed Virgin is symbolized in the Old Testament, the Ark of the Covenant, God no less than commanded them to build a little box in which his glory would dwell and on each side of which would be an angel with its wings aimed inward. On this singular spot in the middle between the angel's wings, that's where the blood of the sacrifice would be dribbled for the atonement of sin. Imagine this, that for centuries they adored a small box where the glory of God was able to be contained, where the forgiveness of sins by the shedding of blood was dribbled over this spot. It's the same spot as the empty tomb, when the angels appear sitting on the slab and say, he is not here, for he is risen. It is also the angel that says, Mary will become pregnant, and the other angel outside the tomb that said, he is risen and he is not here. Between all of these events, angels keep appearing and announcing the transition. It's all written in the symbolism of the Ark of the Covenant that they carried around for all those centuries, not realizing the full significance thereof. And there are those that will say, you can't put God in a box, and yet God delightfully puts himself in this small space if you do the measurements on the Ark of the Covenant. 
and that God, the creator of all the cosmos, can be implanted in the womb of the Blessed Virgin as a human to die for our sins, to fulfill everything that was about that ark, everything that it symbolized, the sacrifices, the shedding of blood, the forgiveness of sins, God in a combined, confined space, God coming forth from that space to destroy his enemies and protect his people when the glory of it would emerge and slay the Philistines and others. All of the symbolism tied up in the ark, in the womb, and in the pregnancy. He describes in Revelation the birth pains of a new creation, that all of the agony and misery of the world that is steadily dying is but birth pains. The metaphor still holds true. The Blessed Virgin, the symbol of the church, the church which carries us inside its womb even now in this ship that sails this ocean of death as an island of life. In here, the church is impregnated with us, going to bring us forth delivered to a new creation, the resurrection and eternal life. It is the pregnancy that leads to the life that is eternal, that is perfect. And in some sense, each and every Christian is pregnant. We have from God deposited inside us the Holy Ghost welling up, the spring that wells to eternal life from this font. It's inside us growing and it's alive and it's cleansing us and changing us and transfiguring us. It is not from us and of us the way pregnancy works among humans. Nevertheless, God who promised that he was putting himself in the Virgin Mary now continues to put his Holy Ghost inside us welling up to eternal life life. The path of the Virgin Mary then, then is our path to which we are called. She is called to humility, to service, to obedience. And this is the Christian walk through a sinful world, being called in every aspect, in every part of our life to do things according to God's command, to the best that our weakness enables, looking and praying always for his Holy Ghost to support us. But above all, it's the finality. When this world finally erupts, when the world comes to an end, when the veil is torn apart and the world of shadows and dust faces the judgment of Almighty God, this is the final birth. The final birth that begins when God created the universe and said, let there be light. The birth that is the new birth sent in the womb of the Blessed Virgin, here in the womb of the church, here in the font and here in the sacraments, the new birth which reaches its finality at the second coming of Christ, when we emerge to a new creation, reborn, alive forever, made pure, though we have been like Mary Magdalene, all of us, wretched sinners, we emerge as pure, image of the church, the Virgin Mary, made chaste and whole and holy for new and eternal life, but there's only infinite life and life and more life and love and love and more love and only good things and only blessedness. In Jesus' name, amen.